Okay, so the goals for today are that last time we started to get acclimated with Visual Studio. So today we're going to create the actual project in Visual Studio, which will be CBDB. We're going to import our project from last time, from part one of the class. We're going to import what we've done so far into the Visual Studio project we'll create in a moment. We will see how we need to integrate those two projects together. Not complex, but there's little details we need to pay attention to. And then we'll also set up uh, the basic aspects of the app, meaning config XML and so forth, and uh, the icons and splash screens. So we'll set those things up, and then we'll have our project imported to then continue to do the work of the of the app, which is then we're going to uh, very soon get into then the database aspect of things, saving these comics, retrieving the data, displaying the data, updating the data, deleting the data, all of that database operations. So I had my test project. That was just a quick test to make sure it all worked. Now what we're going to do in Visual Studio is create then for real our project. And as usual, I'm going to put a copy of my work into the network folder in case you want to compare the code. So the first thing we'll do, file menu, new, project. That test project we worked with a moment ago, you should close that solution. We don't really need it. It's just a test project. So file new uh, project. The important things, of course, here are the name of it and where you're saving it. So I'm just going to call this, uh, put your last name, CBDB. It's going to be the name of the app. Each, each person's app is going to have their own unique or slightly uniqueness in terms of your name is going to be there. And uh, the location, of course, you're going to browse and save that somewhere on your flash drive. I would recommend from the years of experience that it seems that it's going to be best when you save it to your flash drive, save it to the root level of your flash drive, not in a subfolder. I've seen the reason for that is I've seen students You've got a whole bunch of folders and organization as I would as well. But it seems that when you've got long folder names, sometimes the files that you're saving in a subfolder of a subfolder and such, when you need to then copy it from folder to folder, it gives you errors in that it can't copy the, the file name because it's too long. Well, Windows file names are dependent on the, actually the full path. If I've got a file called cat, Dot JPEG, it also depends on is it on the C drive, in the My Documents folder, in the Victor folder, in the Pictures folder, in the Pictures Today folder, cat, JPEG. So I would recommend that you save your project to the root level of your drive, not in a subfolder. That seems to avoid the issues that people sometimes have. So on my flash drive, on the root level, I'm going to select that folder and here, let me just confirm something. This always confuses me, so don't click OK yet. I think as long as you select the F drive, then it makes the subfolder. Just confirm that. Yeah, it does. OK, that'll work. So when, you, uh, when you're on that screen about to select where you're going to save it, as long as this is location F, that'll be fine, because then it says here, create directory. It'll create a folder for your project on your flash drive at the root level. So I don't recommend you save it in any subfolder. You can if you want to, and when it doesn't work, well, hopefully review the lecture when I said don't do that. So go ahead and save that. So we've got the, the, the simple blank Cordova project. Uh, we want to edit the basic aspects of the app Oh, before that, this, um, this screen here that we might see, uh, has, as I've said before, it's got a lot of useful links, but perhaps at some point you close it. Go ahead and close it. You close it, and whoops, I want to get back to that to further read those links or get to those articles. Um, that one is found, again, under Project Overview. That takes you back to the sort of like welcome screen. So if you ever close it and need to get back to it, it's like a special screen or a special file or something. So project overview, you can go back to the top here and it'll take you back to getting to all of this. 
So I'm going to close that, and then I'm going to open the config XML file uh, because we want to edit the, the various basic aspects of config.xml. Go ahead and open that up. Common. Well, this is the name of the app as we created it um, earlier. If you want to change that, you could. But I'm going to keep that there. Start page, keep it. Default locale, keep it. Package name, we talked about this previously. How should that be filled out? How do we make it unique to you? Com dot your last name. Dot the name of the app. Campos CBDB. So obviously here, don't type what I'm typing, because this is my particular one. You want to type your last name, your name of the app. Version number can be anything. I'm going to recommend we do 1.1.the one .1 date. 2018 07. Um, 12. Author. Well, of course, you put in your name here. You are the author of the app, so go ahead and put your name or the name of your company or however you want to be identified, etc. Description. In your own words, what would be the description of a CBDB? Put something in there. Question. I can't see So whatever description you want to add here for CBDB, I'm going to say um, the one and only app you'll ever need to manage your comic book collection. Features include and you know whatever this can be this can be changed at any point. The part of this, the point of this, is that it's also going to be part of the listing when we eventually publish it to the App Store. Uh, if you notice that when we publish to, whenever you see an app in the App Store, it's got a description, it's got an icon, it's you know, it sells itself. So uh, that'll be something that we'll work on a little bit later. We can see features include saving uh, multiple users, saving their own collection. Uh, adding pictures and barcode data. So you can put that or whatever you'd like. This is the part where you can customize it somewhat to your own needs. I want to lock the orientation of the app to portrait. You can leave it either way if you want. Uh, I think portrait works well. Often most apps are portrait, if you think about it, if you use Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn apps, Pinterest, they're often portrait orientation. Games are usually the ones that are landscape. It's okay if you leave it either or default, but um, for the aesthetics of what I want to do here, I'll leave it to portrait. I'm going to save the file jump over to plugins for the moment I want to add the console plugin so to further get more data more feedback from outputting to the console uh, there's a plugin for that so go ahead and add it I'm 
going to save the file. We're going to focus on Android development, so let's jump in there. Last time we glossed over this. Now I'll go to it in a little bit more detail. So these uh, boxes here are important uh, when dealing with what version of Android device is our app compatible with, and what version of our code are we submitting to the App Store. Version code will start at 1. And this is a number that will always increase in whole numbers sequentially. So right now, we are creating version 1 of our code. And this is different, in a sense, from the common one, where I've got 1 dot one dot whatever. These numbers are totally arbitrary. These numbers can be anything. But the one that really matters is this one of version code. So if I'm submitting, if my app were done right now, and I'm submitting it to you know, Google Play App Store, um, they would have a record that I've submitted version 1 of the code. And I, when I add more features and release the next version of the app, I would then be submitting a version code 2, no matter what common says here. That can stay exactly the same. It doesn't matter. I would probably change the date here, too. But what matters to the app stores is this. And even for minor little things, let's say I uploaded my app today, I worked on it for eight hours, I uploaded it, version two, I'm really happy with it, and then I realized I misspelled the name of my own app. Okay, well, I've got to re-upload it, version three. So that number is always going to increase sequentially every time you upload it to the App Store. You start at one. Minimum API, maximum API, target API level, uh, these are um, the internal versions of Android and there's like three ways that Android operating systems are identified. One is the API level, one is the OS level, and one is the code name. So perhaps, you know, if you look at the Android website briefly, you don't have to do this, but if you go to developer.android.com, it'll probably say it's there. Oftentimes they say it right away. I don't see it. That's okay. But um, Android um, code names in, are usually alphabetical by um, by dessert names. There's been Android Cupcake, Android Donut, Android Eclair, Android. F is, what was F? Fudgesicle something. I don't know what it was. I don't have them memorized. But then we had recently Android K, Kit Kat, JKL, um, what was L? Lollipop, uh, M, Marshmallow, N, what was N? Nutella or something? I don't know. Nougat, yes, exactly. And then O, Oreo. So the next one that's coming out is P. I don't know, peanut brittle. I don't know what it's going to be. So there's these code names for the versions of Android. There's also these API levels, which are always sequential. The very, very, very first version of Android was 1. And then Android, you know, Donut or whatever was 3. And the most recent one uh, is like, I don't know, 27 or something. Uh, Oreo. Don't, uh, don't take my word for it. I have to look it up too. But you might also have heard of, well, it's Android 8. Where it's Android 6 or Android 4. Well, it's again three different ways that these things are referred to. The API version is the sequential number from every single version, so that's the one that goes into double digits and such. We're saying, what's the minimum version of Android that our app will run on? I'm going to recommend 14, which translates to, I believe, Android 4.2, which is, I don't know what was 4. Um, honeycomb? I don't know. So, our app will run at least on Android 4, 14. And um, maximum, whatever the newest one is, let, let's say 27, I still wouldn't put the newest one because that's still, that one's not as um, widely adopted. These operating systems, especially on Android, come out and people don't update to them right away as opposed to iOS, 
there's a new version of iOS and people like update to it right away almost because you know Apple forces you as for Android devices the problem is that every device manufacturer is the one that approves your update or not this one is an Asus Android tablet it may or may not be to the latest version I've got a Motorola phone it may or may not be to the latest version so here from my research uh, Android 25 is a good maximum value and then our target 24 what version of Android are we preferring are we targeting our device to work on it can work all the way down to 14 but we're preferring a, a newer one Android 4 point whatever was like so 2010 so we want something newer keep running yes that is when you when you're running the app and then when you click home to go to the home screen the app is still in memory I can still come back to it it's still in memory keep running yes launch mode leave the default show title you can choose yes or no um, no as the default is fine because that's going to be the title in the um, you know at the top of the screen the name of your app which is going to be redundant compared to the to what you've designed in the app so default is no fine are we allowing um, the app to store data in itself yes we'll want to be able to store data so we'll leave that yes and we'll save That's all we needed to change in our config XML at the moment. A couple of things in common. We added one plugin of console, and we've set some Android settings. So I'm going to save that config file, and I'm going to close it. There are still, I think, two little things that we should edit in the config file, but we want to edit it in the code view. Anyone remember how to get to the code of the config XML file? F7, maybe. Right click. Yep, F7. You can right click or and then choose view code or F7. So what I'm getting at is here, line five. This is where you put the name of your um, company or who's the developer and such, but it's got some information here that you probably want to change email you can put a real or fake email here if you want uh, as a contact information for people to contact you regarding your app you can make it up example at fake.com sure and then the href what's the website of your of your company uh, how many of you do have a, a website a domain name like two or three people so it's pretty uncommon to have one unless you're into this world of web design and apps and such. So again, you can just make this up. I don't actually have campus.com. I'll just put it here. You don't really have to have the real domain. It's not going to check it to confirm. You can put anything you want here. You know, like uh, I'll put uh, sdce.edu. Sure. Yeah. What is, how did you get there? I'm still in the after you save it, your config file, you need to close your config file. And then when you close it, you're going to right click the config file and select view code. So here, uh, those are the only two things I also needed to change. Oh, that reminds me. We want to add the splash screen plugin. So after we change the href, href for our website and our email here save the config XML file close it open the design view again and go back to plugins and add the splash screen plugin so I made the change I'm going to save it close it Open the config file as the design view, plugins, splash screen.
Now sometimes I see people activating all the plugins. I would not recommend adding them all. I would only recommend adding the ones you will be using. That's because every plugin takes up more space in your app, in your folder, more time to compile, and makes your final file larger on the device. Plus, all of these are going to be those permissions. When we upload this to the App Store, uh, you've probably seen when you download an app, it says this app would like to access your camera and your microphone and spy on you and etc. Well, why would our app, you know, access your contacts and such? People are going to get confused. Why does this app want to access these features? It looks shady. So, um, only activate the plugins that you will be using or else your app, your app will be slower, it'll be larger, and it'll ask for too many permissions. Okay, I'm going to save and close the config XML file. Inside of the WW folder, let's open the index.html file. Now, as, as you kind of set up your workspace and maybe close panels and all of that, and you want to get panels back, you can go to Window Menu, Reset the Window Layout. So if you lost the panel, if you collapsed it and you don't like how it looks anymore, you can go back to Window Menu, Reset Window Layout. Brings back the windows. So uh, we're going to spend most of our time in our app in the WW folder. We, it comes with several files built in. I have a handout that I mentioned last time, and today we'll look at it in detail. I put a, new, a couple new handouts into the folder from since last time. Uh, we want to open those up so that we can see what those are about. If you go to the network folder, MAD2, I put in there 3 and 4. You can print them a little later or copy them. Uh, I want to open the one 3. Number 3 here. So right there in the sequence, 0 is what you should always do when you set yourself up every day, and then 1 and 2, and we're looking at 3, and then 4. So let's open up number 3. So the heart of our project is our WW folder. We'll spend most of our time there. And there's a variety of things that are built in. Uh, the index HTML. This is our main app. Uh, we could operate in terms of having every different screen be its own HTML file, or keep it all in a single file, as we've been doing, which is an SPA. And via jQuery Mobile that we've been using and will continue to use, we can have these different screens for our app. I break down here uh, some of the important lines to make a note of, if you see it there in Visual Studio, line 8 for security, 11 and 12, those are our mobile friendly, uh, setting ourselves up for mobile friendly. There's that viewport that we had previously. Remember we had the user scalable no and initial scale and all of that. We've seen that. We've got a link to an external CSS file, line 14. So we, we, haven't run, we haven't created any custom CSS code yet. So we've got a file waiting for us eventually. We've got a file that, has, that is already linked to, to be used there. We will be a little bit later transferring our code from the part one of the class into the part two here, so that's something to be aware of. Uh, I mentioned line 25, that's the magic of uh, doing the translation between a plain website into a mobile app. So keep these lines, of course. Line 26, you can write code that will only work 
for a specific platform. You may want, for example, a certain CSS or JavaScript code to be used one way in Android and another way on iOS. Platform override code works with the merges folder, and that's an active link for you to read more if you'd like. The idea is we are creating a basic project that will look the same on all devices. If we want to customize our app to look a certain way on iOS, we use platform overrides. If we want it to look a certain way in Android, we use platform overrides. The app with the basic code can then be manipulated to be different for every device. That is some documentation you should read at some point, and we'll cover it later. What I have here is basically lines 18 to 24. We don't need these lines at all. 18 to 24 is a div that simply shows the uh, uh, Cordova mascot and that text and such. We're going to have our own project, so we don't need that at all. But just temporarily, we can write, and not even special or at all, just write CVDV, no markup or anything. I just want to replace it. We're going to put our own project eventually, very soon. But you don't need any of those anything in those divs. And that's what I've got here in my notes. 18 to 24 can be removed completely. This is used to display the device ready message, which we don't need anymore. CSS folder. Let's open up the CSS file. We'll look at some of these items that we've got in there. And most of that we're also going to remove. We don't want there basic styling. We want our styling from jQuery Mobile and further that we will set up our own fonts and other cool stuff. So in the CSS folder, open index CSS. In the CSS file, OK, universal selector to apply transparent color to any highlighted element. At the very beginning, there is a, there's a line of CSS that when anyone tries to tap something to highlight it, it'll be invisible. Uh, most of the time, when you use an app, you, you cannot select and tap the Facebook icon. And you, know, you can't select pieces of an app. It's, it's already designed. Since this is a web project, technically, on websites, you're able to tap and hold and select text in a website. Line 1 here is saying, hide that selection. Don't break the illusion that this is a real app. So that's a built-in line there that we'll keep. Line 5 is defining various aspects of the app at the moment. This should be customized for your needs. A recommendation is remove most of these, lines 9 through 28. So starting from here, we're defining the body. We're saying a background color, background image, fonts, etc. So I'm going to say that. Yeah, let's remove lines 9 through 28. We don't need that gray color. We don't need that gradient. We don't need that, uh, that font. We're going to set our own fonts. So delete lines 9 through 28. We're left here with background color, a basic background color, basic fonts, font size. Let's see, does this pop up to tell us what color that is? And so these are some fonts. Uh, they're in descending order. These first couple of ones over here are, are for Android devices. So this is saying, if the device has the Roboto regular font, use it. If it doesn't have it, comma, try using that font. If the device doesn't have it, Try using Sego UI. If it doesn't have it, try this one, etc., 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 all the way till the end, till it gets to a generic sans serif. Just use any font. Let the device pick whatever font, generic font. We, of course, will have better fonts later on, but here's our basic font definition. 
and the basic font size. Uh, I'm going to recommend here to set that to 1M. And we'll write a comment here. Base level of font size, 1M, based on the M of a font. If you've had experience in our other classes where we might have learned some graphic design or web design, we've talked about M's in those other classes. If you haven't taken those other classes, an M is a unit of measurement. For fonts, you may be used to something like 12 points in Microsoft Word, or you know, a bigger one, 24 point. Um, we can have the ability also to make our fonts 100% of the default size, or 150%. It's common to use the M measurement, which is based on the letter M of the chosen font. So one basic unit of M of this font. If this font is not available, and this font is, okay, one basic letter M size of our fonts. And this can be fractions, one and a quarter M. So slightly larger than basic size. OK, there's a class of app which can be removed. If your app will be set to portrait orientation only, you could remove this. Lines 54 to 98 should be removed because they also apply to the div we deleted. So what I'm saying here, there's a class of app which is showing the icon, the Cordova icon. But we deleted that whole div in the HTML file, so this doesn't even apply anymore. This code is, is a waste. So delete lines 15 to 25, delete the app class CSS. As I noted, if you're locking your app to be portrait only, that's not necessary either. Because that media query there determines how does your app look when it's landscape. So when it's landscape, it shows there that things get aligned in a different way, like in columns and such. We're going to lock our app to portrait, so that's going to be redundant. I'm going to leave it there in case you want to leave your app to be portrait or landscape. And therefore, you have a spot here for you to edit the uh, landscape version of your app. These next lines about H1 and event and all of that, we're going to delete all of that as well. That all, all of that applied to the div that we deleted. And anyway, this H1, we've already, we're already using H1 and such with jQuery Mobile. So I don't want these definitions of font sizes and such to over, override or fight with jQuery Mobile. So basically, everything after that media query also deleted. So we're keeping relatively very little because we want our design, our colors, our styles. <coughs> yes? And uh, also, you all the way down to the bottom of the page, including the keyframes and the work and all that. Mm -hmm. Yep, all of this too. This was to animate that little blinking device is ready. Well, it doesn't exist anymore. So we're not going to animate that anymore. It's not going to blink, the thing's deleted. So we'll delete everything to the end. Now before we look at the JS file, I want to look at the, at the error panel, view menu, error list, I mean. Let's go up to the view, error list. Remember the error, error list is going to pop up to tell us uh, if there are any errors or warnings in our open files. And I've done very little, and look at this, I see so many problems. Well, they're warnings, not actual errors. If they were real errors, the app wouldn't run. These warnings. 
Some of these we can ignore, some of them we can fix. So this one again, first of all, it says Cordova.js not found. Remember, that's one we're going to ignore because our index.html file is referencing Cordova.js at the end, which doesn't exist until we run it. So we could ignore that one. These other ones I would like to fix, mostly. So this one says, in the index CSS file, line 1, the universal selector asterisk is known to be slow. So we have here the universal selector, the very beginning, where we said, everything that you tap on, turn it invisible, so that it doesn't look like someone's actually tapping a website. That one's going to be one that I'm going to ignore. Because what that is saying is to every everything in your app, apply this. Every paragraph, every body, every heading, every link, every picture in a div, whatever. So I'm going to ignore this one. And again, there's no way to say right click ignore. You're just going to need to ignore it. These other ones. The property MS text size adjust is compatible with WebKit text size adjust and should be included as well. If you double click a line, it'll jump you to where it's recommending it. And it's saying here, if you're using WebKit text size adjust, it recommends you also use MS text size adjust. So OK, I'm going to heed that one. So at the end of line 7, give yourself a new line, dash MS. dash text dash size and as if it pops up here to help you the, just press tab for it for it to auto complete colon space none well what that is saying these are called vendor prefixes different devices interpret the code in a different way unfortunately one device might take a code and render it a certain way, and one a different way. If we specify the possibilities in the different types of devices, we can cover the basis to make sure that it, works the, that it looks and works the best on all platforms. So WebKit, if you want to make a note, code for Chrome devices, which is Android. MS. And you wonder what MS stands for? Microsoft. Micro code for Microsoft devices. So Windows. WebKit actually is code for Chrome devices and iOS devices. That's why that one was. That's why that one was the default. WebKit, it's applying to both of those types of devices. It's a slash asterisk, so shift eight. So it further says dash mo's user selected. So after user select. Remember, you can double click this and it'll jump you to the line. So it says it also recommends dash mo's dash user select none. Once I add the line and save it, then the message goes away. Mo's, M-O-Z. What, what do you think that one stands for? Mozilla. Mozilla devices. For a time, the Mozilla Foundation, the ones behind Firefox, they were working on their own operating system. Just like the operating system Android or Windows, etc. The Mozilla people, they were creating their own Mozilla operating system for phones. Um, I don't think the project is still alive at the moment. They decided to focus on web browsers. But here, for full compatibility, one extra line of code, we add it. A 
it's then the next line here saying dash ms dash user select none that one got rid of one more message I'm down to seven missing standard property user select to go along with webkit user select so we've got the Mozilla okay we've got the Android version and iOS. We've got the Mozilla version, we've got the Microsoft version. There is also a standard version, which is simply called user select. None as well. So the great thing about standards is everyone can make a standard. But then it's not a standard anymore. So that is like the default, supposed to be most correct version of the code, simply user select. But because different Manufacturers, different devices, different companies feel their version is the best. Everyone's got a standard. So to be the most compatible, we said, okay, here's the version for Chrome, the version for Mozilla, the version for Microsoft, the version for everyone. Saving that, I'm down to five warnings. Two of them I'll have to ignore, remember, the Cordova one and the universal selector. Values of, of zero shouldn't have units specified. Double click that. All of these that say zero pixels, we don't actually write that. We don't write zero pixels, it's just zero. When it's zero, it's just zero, not zero pixels. One more right there. All of those warnings, our app would have still worked if we had left the warnings. If we had gotten any errors, that's a problem and that needs to be fixed. These warnings were not fully necessary to fix, but I personally would want it to be as correct as possible. And then these last ones, we're, we're just going to need to ignore them, or we can do this here. Don't show me warnings. But that might be too much because other warnings might appear that you do want to look at. So. There's no way to just say, don't show me these anymore. But that's fixed enough. Let's go over to our scripts.js file. Index.js, I mean. There's going to be some, some items here that pop up when we open up our index.js file. These are super easy to fix. Unnecessary semicolon in a couple of places. Double-clicking the first one. Technically, it does not need a semicolon at the end of function definitions. So I'm going to remove each of those semicolons at the end of each of these function definitions, except the very, very last one that's not the end of a function definition, it's executing a function. When I remove those three, I get the final three issues from my JS removed. What I do want to do, however, is remember our good practice of, of writing a note at the end of the curly braces. This curly brace goes back and connects with on device ready. So we should just continue our good practice here to say this is the end of on device ready. This is the end of on pause. This is the end of on re resume. Yes, it was there automatically, and that's why we fixed it by removing it. Yes, that's what the note down here was saying. Okay, so these are the things that the error list is telling me. 
And again, this is going to be so valuable for us going forward uh, that uh, when we're writing our code, um, before you call me over for a little help, probably if you look here first, this will be your first line of fixing the issues. Because again, you, you just double click an item and it'll take you to the file and the line number and hopefully this might explain it enough to fix it. And if not, of course, I'll still help you out. But uh, that has been so useful for us in the past. Back on the handout. Uh, scripts folder. There's a, there's a comment and a line up here that you can go off at some point and further read from the Visual Studio documentation more about what this template file is. So if you need a little bit of bedtime reading, go off and follow that link and then see what further they say about using the template. I'm going to leave the comment there because I might want to read it eventually. And the rest of here, uh, this, this begins the iffy, the immediately invoked function expression, which we've used before. All of our code needs to be inside of this, so you could technically write code outside of it, but you don't want to because of the issues of going outside the, the namespace. And um, we've got our strict mode, leave that on. Line 8, very important. In order for Cordova to work, we need to detect that the device it's running on is ready. If the device ready event occurs, we then run on device ready function. Without this line, we cannot use any of the Cordova JavaScript code. So any of the code we get from cordova.apache.org will not work if the device never alerts us that it is connected, so to speak. So very important to never remove line 8. No need to change it at all. And then line 10, another one, very important to keep. Well, once the device is ready, run this function. All of the code we've been writing so far in part one of the class will eventually go inside of on device ready. We'll do that together. We've got if the user exits the app or returns to the app, a couple of other events happened. So when the app loads up, the device will say device ready, and then our app can start. But when a person clicks home to go home, the, the app right there, the device emitted a pause event, which then we can listen for and capture and run a function on pause, which is currently empty. Conversely, if the app is still in memory, if I press the app switcher, oops, if I pr press the app switcher and switch back to my app still in memory, that the device emitted the resume event, and our handler here caught it, and then runs a function on resume, which is empty at the moment. It, run? it says right there. It knows to run on pause, and it knows to run on resume. And these were already created for us in the template. But run what? Is it going to perform something, or is it just going to just work? It's going to perform whatever is inside of the function, which is currently nothing. Uh -huh. We will add something here. Let's go over to line 24. Give yourself a new line 25. These functions don't do anything. I want to have some super basic console output. I want in the console to show me we've returned to the app, we've exited the app. So as usual, as we were doing last time, part one, console.log message, we exited the app. And then in the resume, console log, we returned to the app. So a new line there inside of re resume. I keep wanting to call it resume, but resume console log. We returned to the app. What would what could be done with these resume and pauses? The the note here. 
this application has, has been suspended. Save application state here, restore application state. So if, for example, this were a game, in the middle of the game, someone needs to go answer their text message, so they pause it, they, they, they leave. Well, that would be a great time for my app then to save the score currently. Save it into, into memory. Then when I return to the game, restore it all. Keep the, play the music, restore the points, etc. So those right now don't do anything except our console log here. But it's set up by default that it knows that when we pause or resume, run a function, which currently just have console outputs. Um, I'm also noting all of the code we're going to run is basically going to, or 99% of the code we're going to run is going to be in the on device ready somewhere between those lines. Line 16 through 20. You may remove these lines if you remove the div from the index file, which we did. We no longer. We no longer need to create objects of the divs with that ID and no longer display the message about loading device or device ready, ready to go. We no longer need to edit any, we don't need to use any of that, so all of these lines right here, including the comment, delete these lines. So before the end of our on device ready, but after our event listeners for pause and resume, just delete all of that. We're not using it at all. We will have a quick console log output saying Cordova is ready to lock. So when we compile it in a moment, when we run it in a moment, uh, our app will look super basic. But then I also want to see in the Visual Studio console some of these messages. I want to confirm that on device ready fired and that it ran the function. So we should see that. You can then practice by quitting or uh, closing and launching the app. And it should tell you these things in the console. Let's see anything else in my notes before that. Uh, conclusion. If we have a strong knowledge of web languages, we can create cross-platform mobile apps. Using the code we learn at cordova.apache.org, we can write JavaScript that will allow us to access the native features of any device. And via Visual Studio, we have an all-in-one IDE, an integrated development environment, a coding app that lets us code, debug, and deploy. Further reading. Let's give that a shot. Run this in your device or in the browser. Confirm you don't get any errors. Make sure the app loads up. It'll just be super basic. It'll just say CBDB, really, really basic, really simple. But then in Visual Studio, you will get a panel down at the bottom called JavaScript Console. So all of these console messages should appear in the JavaScript Console in a moment. Now that we're running this off of our USB drive, it'll probably be a little slower than last time when we were running it out of my documents on the, on the hard drive. So again, usually the first time you do this compile, this compilation, it's a little slow. But after the first time, it gets faster because all the important stuff has been compressed, has been optimized, and subsequent time should be faster. You can confirm that something is happening 
by uh, seeing a little bar, green bar growing at the bottom. The green bar also grows inside of the name of the app. And these like little puzzle pieces are forming together. If those things are moving, it's still thinking. If that's moving, it's still processing and thinking. If for whatever reason you need to cancel this because you need to leave and then you need to pull your drive out, you can go up to build cancel. But you usually don't need to. There it is if necessary. Also control break on the keyboard. So in this set it in this case it said it took for me I saw somewhere it took like one minute or something. Okay, so then uh, I saw the splash screen for a moment and it went to my app and it says CBDB in the corner, really, really simple. That gray background there is still annoying me, so I'll remove that. But it says CBDB. And now I see the console here. JavaScript console and it loaded up the index file it's gonna have a warning that it couldn't load up the fav icon don't worry about that and uh, it should have also then said the the output for ready to rock I'm gonna go I press the home button to go home I saw that we exited I'm gonna go back to the app We returned. Sometimes it doesn't say the ready to rock right away for some reason, but I am confirming that it is seeing these other ones. So that's if that works, at least you're you're all right. And so this says on your index file, JS file, line 19, it had that output, and on line 24, it had that output. I'm going to change something here. I don't like that gray background that's in the CSS file. Background color, white. So uh, let's pause for our first break. Let's confirm that all of this works. Um, run it on the device and such. It's just about 7. We'll take a break until 7.10, and then we'll go on.